There is another common way of networking containers, a technology that Docker calls linking containers. On the plus side, linking containers is more secure than exposing ports the way we've been doing so far. But on the downside, it only works for container-to-container -container communication, not for communicating with the outside world. Let's quickly run through the high-level theory before we dive in and configure it. So the first thing to note is that when talking about linking containers, we've got a source and a recipient or a receiver. First, we fire up the source container. It's built from an image that's got certain ports declared as exposed in the Docker file that was used to create the image, but we don't need to expose those ports at runtime when the container's launched. So they're not mapped through to ports on the Docker host, so not available to the outside world. Then we spin up the recipient container, and when we do this, we create a link back to the source. At this point, the source tells the recipient various things about its networking config, IP address, protocols, ports and the likes. And this info gets stored inside of the recipient container. And what do we end up with? Well, this means that the recipient container has knowledge of the source container's networking config, and it can reach it and communicate with it but all without any ports on the source having to be exposed. Sounds simple enough. Let's go see it in action. Well, the first thing we need is a source container. But even before that, we need an image, yeah? Well, we've already got one prepared here called IMG, and it was built from this Docker file. So we can see here we've got port 80 listed as being exposed. Cool. Now let's start a container from it. Now then, when linking containers, container names are absolutely crucial, because Docker uses the container's name when it creates the link. So we'll call this one source, or SRC. Now the name's arbitrary, right? You don't need to call it source, and in fact, you almost certainly won't. I'm just calling it source here, so that it's uber clear that this is the source container. Just using the name as a teaching aid, yeah? Well, we'll run it detached, and we'll base it off our IMG image. Magic. Let's check that it's running. There it is there. But hang on a minute. What's this port business here? We didn't expose the port when we launched the container, so why is it listed there? Well, this is just telling us that port 80 is defined in the image as being exposed. Notice, it's not actually listed as being mapped through to any port on the Docker host. So, it's not actually exposed on the Docker host. Anyway, let's fire up a recipient container. We'll call this one receiver. Again, it's arbitrary, and I'm just using names to make things as clear as possible. Next up, we add the link option. And as you've no doubt guessed, this is how we define the link back to the source container. So, we give the link the name of the source container. That was source for us a colon, and then we give it an alias, like a nickname, yeah? So we'll go with Ali Source. Now a couple of points. Both of these fields are mandatory. We have to specify the name of the source and give it an alias. But, and this is fairly common, the name and the alias can be the same, meaning we could have gone Source Source. Again, I'm probably bugging you with this by now, but I just prefixed this with Ali so that it's uber clear later on that this is the alias. Okay, we'll make this one interactive. We'll base it on an Ubuntu image. And we'll run a shell inside of it as PID1. And you'd think I'd be able to spell Ubuntu by now. Let's go and fix that. Magic. We've got our two containers running, source and receiver. And the link's all created. Not hard at all, was it? If we docker inspect receiver, scroll up a bit, there it is. We can see the link defined, a link to source called, or aliased, Ali source. But if we check here, there's no such link from the source to the recipient. No. Now then. Remember when we looked at the theory a minute ago, we said the source populated the target with a bunch of network-related information. 
Let's jump inside of our recipient container and see exactly what that looks like. Now, first up, the source provides the receiver with a bunch of environment variables. These ones here that all start with Ali underscore source. Hmm, let's do this. Yeah, that's better. So, a bunch of variables, right, containing details of the source containers, IP address and exposed ports and the likes. Also, Docker adds an entry to the recipient containers hosts file. Yeah, this maps the alias name back to the IP address of the source. Magic. I love it, okay? But what's the point? Well, a couple of major things. First up, we already mentioned that this is more secure than exposing ports. Remember, we've got no ports exposed here. So in theory, only the recipient container knows about the source container's networking config. Great. Second up, though, the recipient container can take these values and it can use them to dynamically and programmatically configure itself. And this is potentially awesome, okay? So let's say our recipient container has an app or an app script that starts when the container starts. And that app needs to talk to a service on another container. That will be on the source container. Well, that app or app script can use these values to dynamically configure itself to communicate with the service in the source container and all without any help, so no external dependencies. And that's a really good thing, right? Though, I will caveat this. In reality, it does mean that our apps need to know about these environment variables and the likes ahead of time so that they can be coded in. Anyway, that's linking containers. Oh, I nearly forgot. We can actually link multiple recipient containers to a single source container and a single recipient container to multiple sources. Good stuff. Now, let's go and wrap up the module by recapping what we've covered.